The AMD Ryzen 5000 series of CPUs powered by their new Zen 3 architecture have been hyped, leaked, and teased for months now, but launch day has finally arrived, and we can share benchmarks and performance comparisons with you guys at home. Has AMD's relentless Ryzen assault over the past three plus years finally resulted in processors that eclipse Intel's CPU counterparts in all areas, gaming included? Yes. Yes, it has. More details in this video though. So here is my gaming and performance review of the 12 core 24 thread Ryzen 9 5900X. Excellent. Corsair has new cases. The 4000 series presents a solid mix of looks, functionality, and affordability for new and veteran PC builders alike. A spacious interior and the rapid route cable management guides make for easy assembly with room for up to 620 millimeter or 440 millimeter fans. The 4000D Airflow features an optimized airflow focused front panel while the IQ 4000 exports sexy tempered glass panels and is RGB ready with the included lighting node core. Click the sponsor link in the description for more. So there are actually four Ryzen 5000 CPUs launching today. The six core 12 thread 5600X for $300. The eight core 16 thread 5800X for $450. The 12 core 24 thread 5900X that I'm reviewing, which goes for $550. And the flagship 5950X, 16 cores and 32 threads for $800. The 5600X is the only model that ships with a cooler this time around. And while it's pretty reasonable to assume that people will be interested in aftermarket cooling for these CPUs, it it is an additional cost that should be factored in if you're building a system with the eight core and up models. Intel doesn't ship a cooler with their unlocked CPUs either, so it's kind of a wash there. AMD has made a lot of changes under the hood with Zen 3, most notably with the CCX design, the core complex that makes up each eight core chiplet. There is now a unified design with a shared 32 megabyte L3 cache accessible by all eight cores in each CCX unit, rather than a four plus four design with dual 16 meg caches. This reduces core to core latency which is key for improved gaming performance, among other things, and two of these eight core chiplets are used in the 5950X for 16 cores total, and chiplets with disabled cores are used for the other CPU models. So the 5900X has two chiplets with six cores each for 12 total, and so on, keeping the core count symmetrical between the two chiplets. There are a host of other architectural improvements as well with Zen 3, all geared towards increasing speed or reducing latency, but I'll spare you the details on those so we can transition over to the benchmarking setup. So here are my comparison CPUs for today. I am keeping things straightforward with a four horse race. And since AMD is claiming to now be better than Intel's best, I am comparing Intel's best current desktop CPU on their mainstream platform, the 10 core 20 thread Core i9-10900K. For AMD last gen representation for Zen 2, we have the 5900X's predecessor, the Ryzen 3900X, also with 12 cores and 24 threads, as well as the flagship 3950X with 16 cores and 32 threads. The 3900X was going for $440 as of yesterday on Amazon, and the 3950X was $710, and the 10900K's price had actually gone up since it launched. Uh, go figure, it's selling for $550 right now. The details of my testbed setup can be seen on screen now for both the AMD and the Intel sides, but the important pieces used across all systems are the memory, a 16GB G-Skill DDR4 3600CAS latency 16 kit, the GPU, which is the new NVIDIA RTX 3080 Founders Edition, and the CPU cooler, the 280mm NZXT Kraken X62 all-in-one liquid cooler. For comparative power draw testing, an EVGA G3 750 watt 80 plus gold power supply was used, and the systems were set up in open test beds with the radiator fans pushing air across the motherboard BRMs for consistency. And now let's go over system performance, starting with frequencies. Here are the speeds that each CPU is running at. I'm showing the peak frequency that each CPU hit across all tests, as well as the sustained all core frequency during the Ida 64 stress test. With PBO enabled, the 5900X hit 4.95 gigahertz peak, just shy of five gigahertz, which is pretty impressive, while averaging 4.47 gigahertz across all cores during the stress test. That's more than 350 hertz faster on all cores out of the box than the last gen 3900X, which should push some nice gains in real world performance. For power draw, I'm measuring the wattage drawn by the entire system during a blender render using version 2.82a, and here we see a bit of a trade-off for that peak frequency. Even with the efficiency benefits of AMD's seven nanometer manufacturing process, average draw is at 279 watts, right on par with Intel's 10900K. 
Sure, the 5900X has two more cores and four more threads, but even compared to the 16 core 3950X, we're still drawing about 30% more power on average. And this is usually less of a concern for desktop users, but efficiency shouldn't be ignored completely. And it's also worth noting that the 10900K power draw shown here is for power limit one, and that drops along with frequency once the limit is reached if you don't go and manually change it, which is technically an overclock. Next up, we have thermal comparisons showing the average temperature after a 10 minute Ida64 burn-in test. And here again, it should be pointed out that Intel's stock settings with the 10900K resulted in it switching to power limit two mode for most of the test, dropping the frequency to 4.6 to 4.7 gigahertz on average, which allowed the Kraken X62 to maintain chilly temps at 52C. With that power limit disabled, the 10900K will run closer to 70C, and you can check out my 10900K review for more on that. The 5900X, meanwhile, does get warm, hitting 84.5C max on both CCDs and averaging 74.7C on the hotter of the two. That's a small but appreciable improvement in temperatures over the 3900X, especially considering the higher clock speeds. And now my friends, it's time for the actual benchmarks. Uh, starting with Cinebench R20 to see if we can confirm AMD's numbers from their announcements last month. And we can. AMD said to expect a score of over 8,000 in the multi-threaded test, and we hit 8836 with our setup. That's about 28% uh, faster than the 10 900K and a 19% bump over the 3900X. 19%, that number sounds familiar. But anyway, AMD has been on top for a while with the multi-threaded scores, so here's the single-threaded test. We got 633 points. That's almost 100 points more than the 10900K, about 15% faster and 16 to 17% faster than the 3000 series CPUs. I wasn't expecting that AMD was lying about the single-thread uplift with their announcements last month, so this was somewhat expected, but still a really impressive gen-over-gen -gen improvement. CPU Mark is next. It's part of the Passmark performance test suite, and it runs a series of synthetic workloads to determine overall performance. Multi-threaded scores will leverage all the cores and threads available, so it's again very impressive that the 5900X is beating out the 3950X by just under 10%, even though it has 16 cores versus 12. The 5900X was 12% faster than the 3900X and 35% faster than the 10900K here. In the CPU Mark single-threaded test, the 5900X was on top again by 8.4% over the 10900K and 11.5% over the 3900X's score of 3047. Blender is next, which is a free and open source 3D creation suite for modeling, animation, simulation, and rendering. We're looking at the Splash Fishy Cat render here, which is a short one, and time is shown, so faster is better. The 5900X shows a marginal improvement over the 10900 K here, but can't keep up with the 3900X or 3950X, which both performed quite well. I think the extra time for the 5900X actually came in the post-render phase of this test though. So with the BMW render test, which takes much longer to render, we see times that are more in line with our expectations. The 5900X is 25% faster than the 10900K and 12% faster than the 3900X, while still trailing the 3950X by 14% due to its higher core and thread count. Next, we have a video transcoding test via Handbrake taking a three minute H.264 4K video and transcoding it to 1080 H.265. The encoding speed is shown as a frame rate and at 55.8 frames rendered per second, the 5900X is 15% faster than the 3950X, 18% faster than the 3900X, and 20% faster than the 10900K. Here is V-Ray, which is a software solution by Chaos Group that helps artists and designers create photo reel imagery and animation for design, television, and feature films. And they also have a nice little benchmark package for hardware testing that spits out a result in K samples. Here, the faster 12 cores of the 5900X are trying to catch the slower 16 cores of the 3950X, and it comes close, but the 3950X is still 3.5% faster. The Corona Renderer is a modern high-performance photorealistic renderer available standalone or as a plug-in for 3D Studio Max or Cinema 4D. And again, we're looking at time to render, so lower is better. The 3950X came out on top here by a margin just shy of 2%, and the 5900X was 22% faster than the last gen 3900X in this test. Here is 7-Zip, and I like the 7-Zip test because it's one of the more common tasks you can do with a computer. Basic file compression and decompression using the 32 megabyte dictionary size setting. The 5900X aced the compression test, scoring 82,267, which is 9.5% faster than the 3950X and 26% faster than the 10900K. For decompression, the 3950X won out again due to its core and thread count, and it was 6% faster. The 3900X and 10900K were 17 and 35% slower than the 5900X, respectively. And now let's check out a batch of gaming benchmarks, and we'll see if the 10900K 
is still on top in gaming. I'm running all the games except 3D Mark at 1080p, a relatively lower resolution where CPU performance will make a difference in the frame rates we achieve, and we're running a stock RTX 3080 Founders Edition for our GPU. 3D Mark Time Spy Extreme is our first test. It's a synthetic benchmark from 3D Mark. It's a DirectX 12 test, and here the 3080's graphics score did not vary much between CPUs because it's at a higher resolution and more GPU bound. It does show that when CPU limitations aren't a factor, usually at higher resolutions like 4K, you should get performance like this, within a couple percentage points for the same graphics card. That said, there's also a CPU test in this benchmark, and here the 5900X was 20% faster than the 3900X from last gen with the same core and thread count. Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is a recent addition to my benchmark suite. Visually, it's an amazing game that lets you fly anywhere in the world, and while it's still a DirectX 11 title, high levels of detail and draw distance still make maintaining a high frame rate difficult. It didn't stop the 5900X from beating the 10900K in the first head-to-head -head actual game test in this video though, and even though it's a, only a win of about 1.6%, a win is a win. The 5900X got more frames out of the 3080 than the 10900K. Meanwhile, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is running in DirectX 12 mode and also showing off the gains for the 5900X over Intel and last-gen Ryzen. 175.5 FPS is 6.5% faster than the 10900K and 25 to 28% faster than the Ryzen 3000 series chip. GTA 5 is a newly released game that I think you guys are going to really enjoy a lot. Okay, it's not, it's, it's very old now, but it's also very popular and consistent when it comes to CPU performance. So yet again, we have a 1-2% to win for the 5900X over the 10900K, hitting 179.6 FPS, and also winning the 1% low battle with a nice uplift over the 3900X. Total War 3 Kingdoms is also running in DirectX 12 mode, and we're running the campaign benchmark. The 5900X clocks its biggest win over the 10900K in this game, 7.3%. 3% faster than Intel, and about 13-14% to 14 ahead of the Ryzen 3000 CPUs. Rounding things out with Metro, Exodus, and Intel wins. Intel, yes. Just as AMD showed in some of their charts, not all games are created equal, and some perform better in some situations than others. Overall performance may be better, but Metro Exodus was down on the bottom of the list with games that performed slightly worse on a Zen 3 CPU, along with some others like DirectX 12 Fortnite, Battlefield 5, Ghost Recon Wildlands, and Rainbow Six Siege. In my testing, the 10900K was about 7% faster than the 5900X in Metro Exodus, hitting 129.9 FPS. And now for a summary, and hello and welcome to everyone who just jumped ahead straight to this part. Uh, you're very smart and very efficient with your usage of time. Here are my aggregate scores across all tests, starting with compute performance. Based on my tests in terms of compute power, the 5900X is a 3950X? Not really, there are some tests where the core count of the 3950X wins, and there's some where the improved IPC performance of the 5900X does more, so it is situational, but 100% performance versus 100.1% performance was very close with those two overall. A 13% uplift for the 5900X over the 3900X is quite nice though, and the 10900K is down by quite a bit because fewer cores and less performance per core, so minus 21.6% in the compute category for Intel. Gaming though, that Metro Exodus win for the 10900K wasn't enough to claw back too much ground, so the 5900X wins by 1.8% overall. Again, a small margin, but Intel's margin over Zen 2 hasn't always been that significant either, depending on the game that you're testing. Also though, you're getting more than a 10% boost in gaming with the 5900X over the 3900X and 3950X, so AMD deserves credit for taking things to the next level with Zen 3. Here's one final chart with pricing listed as well, because I feel like it helps to have that all on one page. It does seem like Intel needs to fix the 10900K's price and get it back to 500 bucks, if not less than that. 500 was the original MSRP, or that's what they told us, because at 550, it's really a tough sell as the slower chip for gaming without PCIe 4.0 support and more than 20% less compute performance. To sum up though, I think AMD has yet another winner on their hands with the 5900X. Yes, it is slightly more expensive than the 3900X's launch price, 550 versus 500, but I think that is justified by the improved performance and the price at which Intel is currently selling the 10900K. This processor would be an ideal solution for a gamer who also needs the additional cores and threads for workstation tasks or video editing, and with that gaming performance boost and compatibility with existing 500 series AM4 motherboards, 
as well as 400 series AM4 motherboards. Once the UAFI updates are ready, ready from the manufacturers, it makes it really hard to find any angle to come at this where you could say Intel is a practical or better option. Even looking at some of the recently released stats from Intel's upcoming CPUs, the again delayed Rocket Lake, which Newegg coincidentally tweeted about just a day before the Zen 3 launch, we have only up to eight cores, fewer PCIe 4.0 lanes, still a 14 nanometer based product. I mean, I guess if their IPC claims hold up, they might retake that best for lower res CPU limited gaming crown, but those aren't expected to launch until March. Zen 3, meanwhile, is available, hopefully now, and while availability is a concern long term, I did want to point out that when the 3950X launched, there was definitely a supply shortage at first, uh, but that did ease up over time. There is hope that these new CPUs won't be difficult to find in the same way that these NVIDIA 30 series cards are, for example. So if you're buying a new mainstream CPU and you want the best performance performance, the choice is pretty clear right now. Get an AMD Ryzen 5000 series CPU, and I think the 5900X is a good bet, again, if you need those extra cores and threads over something like the 5800X or 5600X. Speaking of which, I am planning on doing some coverage on those other CPUs in this lineup, I just don't have all of them yet, uh, but I really hope you guys have enjoyed this video, and I will put very important links to click down in the description, and uh, if you have comments, of course, I'd be interested to read them, and let me know if you're surprised at all at how well the 5900X performs, or if you were expecting more or less or something in between. Subscribe to my channel though if you're not already if you want to see when those upcoming videos are posted and check out my store at paulsharbard.net for shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and other cool stuff you can buy. Uh, if you enjoyed this video definitely hit the thumbs up button on your way out and we'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.